automating research data workflows. We have a few use cases for this. There's the basic one where you just want to transfer something on ad hoc, but more routinely, you have a simulation that's running and you want to periodically um, copy data to another system. You have a synchronization task where an instrument is generating data and you want to move it to a secondary place for uh, processing, or you just routinely want to back up your home directory to another system uh, for peace of mind. Another one might be that you want to uh, stage data to start a compute job, say from your laptop, um, or you want to transfer data when you're starting a compute job from another center, et cetera. So there's different ways to achieve this. Uh, like some of the other centers, for examples, have added directives to the job submission scripts to achieve it. Um, or you have something else that manages it. And we, we're basically that other application that manages data staging. Something that I think is becoming more relevant, even within the context of the leadership computing facilities, are portal and science gateways. This is where a portal or a web application is going to do a particular type of processing for a say science domain and they uh, have the ability to they know how to execute certain compute applications on a remote resource and the user will upload data to a particular location for input or uh, will input in parameters the science gateway will then transfer the either input or results but they'll do this asynchronously for the user. So the portal or web application is acting as a automated client doing things on your behalf, moving data, but it's able to do that while you're off doing other things um, and not needing to manage the transfer of the data. So let's talk about what Globus has in particular to enable these types of out of band data movement capabilities that uh, for automation. One of the key aspects to this is the concept of a native application. So the most of you are familiar with your iPhone uh, or other Android devices. These are these applications that you install from the App Store that you then log in with uh, Google or some other credentials. One aspect about them is that the application itself cannot be trusted to have a secret deployed with it. Um, it's very different if you are a system administrator and you are logging on to a system and you can then go and create a secret that it can call out to other systems with. So when you're root on a system and you can deploy a script and you can put a token in there or a key or a certificate, then that can be trusted to go and do stuff. So those, those can keep things confidential. In the case of an application that you're going to install in your home directory or on your phone or a Jupyter notebook, those applications, uh, when they're deployed and stored, they can't keep a secret inside of them. So what they do instead is when you log into it, when it's installed, then it keeps a credential on your behalf and is able to use it. So. We have a command line application that I'll be demonstrating. We have Jupyter Notebooks that I'll show you. The, these native applications get registered with Globus Auth, and then they are allowed to get a token from you to call out to stuff. And this capability is deployed in our SDK. When you are the user with a browser and you're trying to log in, and I'll show you this in a moment, you run the application where this would be like the Globus command line tool or one that you've written for another case. It sends you back a URL and opens a browser. You then go to Globus Auth, which brokers the transaction with the ALCF or another identity provider. It's given back an auth code, which is a temporary token. 
that is sent back to the application. And then the application can go and retrieve the access tokens. So step seven is the, once it has access tokens, these are the ones that it can use when you then want to do later things like do a transfer and submit the transfer. So the first few steps are all around running the application and then hidden behind the scenes is that handshake where it gets a temporary code to go and get tokens. And like I said, if you've ever logged in to an application using Facebook or Google or GitHub um, on your iPhone, you've basically seen a, seen a tool go through the step. So what this gives us is the ability to leverage the same web authentication where you can verify the identity provider that you're using, use the ALCF identity provider for certain things, your home institution for other cases, and still have this command line application that can call out to the API. So you don't have to have um, separate uh, API tokens or things like that to manage. We wanna keep things as close to familiar when it comes to identity and access as possible. So let me demonstrate that briefly. So what's gonna happen here is I'm going to first log out of my Globus command line tool. This is the CLI tool that we use. And then I'm gonna log in. And when I do this, you're gonna see it's going to redirect to my browser. So Globus help tool. There's a command line that I'm interested in. Globus login. So now I've been taken back over to the Globusoft login page. Um, I'm going to log in, in my case, with my Argon identity. It redirects me to the Argon identity provider. I can see I can see the URL. I can see it was on the right page. I then grant consent. This says I'm allowing this application, the Globus command line tool, to do certain things, basically to hold tokens to call different APIs. I say allow, and I've been able to log in. Close this one, and when we go back to the terminal, what we see here is there was my original call to Globus login, and it says you should open, open up a browser window Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And if I do Globus, who am I? It goes out, and this is my primary identity within Globus. Um, this command here, because many of you should be asking yourselves in your head if you deal with HPC systems and supercomputers, is well, that's great, but what if I'm SSH'd into another system? In that case, you can run Globus login, no local server. And what it'll do instead lowest login no local server what instead is it gives you a url it basically generates the url that would have been triggered to open the browser because here on my laptop there's hooks in the terminal where it can kick open the browser and stuff like that. Instead, I can also take this string. Repeat my login process. Get the code, paste it in here, and then in the background it does the exchange. So this capability allows you to have command line applications for various purposes uh, on different systems uh, that you log into with your identity, again, without having to deal with more keys and more certs and things like that. We routinely use this also to write our own custom applications that have the same login capability and then the ability to call out to other APIs. PowerPoint. Okay. So with that in mind, let's keep going.
there's another aspect of this that access tokens, um, this is an OAuth2 term from the standard that defines how you call REST APIs. Uh, access tokens are short-lived, you know, minutes, hours, sometimes even less than that. And so when you get a single access token via a grant like this, unfortunately, <clears throat> it will expire because we don't want them sitting around and you're sending them all over the web and things like that. So we want to have a means to let them expire and that way it limits the risk that somebody grabs one and exposes something. So if somebody gets an access token, it they have a very short window in which to do something malicious with it. So instead, what we have is a concept of a refresh token. So when we're getting these access tokens to call Globus Transfer, to call Globus Auth, to look up identities, to look at groups, we can also issue a refresh token. And the refresh token is issued for the exact same scope, so it's only relevant to the particular service that you want to call, and they're good for six months after they're last used. And the important part about that is if you think that the, suppose you install the Globus command line tool on a system and you later get an email that it's had a compromise or something, you can go in and revoke those. You don't have to worry that the system itself, they may have gotten your access tokens and stuff like that. As soon as you find out, you can revoke that permission and all the refresh tokens are invalid. The access tokens were probably expired anyways. And that means that we have means to uh, limit the, the exposure. So this is just to get you familiar with how these things are working from a security perspective. And when you do have refresh tokens in play, it means that if you have a script you're running regularly, those refresh tokens make it used routinely. And so they keep going on and on. So you don't have to go back in and periodically log in, at least from the perspective of Globus Auth. <clears throat> so the refresh token works where after you've done all these steps, if you have the token, uh, you can, after you have your regular token, you can request a refresh token. You get the refresh token, it's stored, and then you can exchange it for a new access token to then call services. For the most part, when you use our SDK or the CLI, this is completely transparent to you. Um, you don't need to uh, be concerned about it. But if you are building a native app application, you should be aware of whether or not you want to use refresh tokens. For example, in a moment, I'll show you our JupyterHub instance. We do not store refresh tokens on that because it's a demo environment and we don't want people to routinely have refresh tokens laying around and potentially, um, if that was ever compromised, it just is an extra risk. So you can decide whether or not they're relevant. We will, there's sample codes here that you can look at as well when we share the slide deck. All right, now for the stuff, the nuts and bolts that are very relevant to day-to-day -day life around supercomputers. Okay. Uh, Globus CLI, native application distributed by Globus, the very, very easy to install. Um, literally, if you go to Google and you type something like um, Globus CLI, it's in PyPy. For those of you familiar with Python installations, and so you can pip install Globus CLI and it will drop down onto your machine for use. You've seen the command uh, Globus login. It stores the tokens locally in your home directory with the usual types of restricted permissions in a config file. And from there, um, this may be relevant for where you call it because 
it is a client application. It does need to call out to other services. Um, some systems do not have external routes from compute nodes, so you may be only able to use it on a login node. It is not the thing moving the data conceptually. It's just calling the transfer API to move the data from the data transfer nodes. So it does not need a large heavy bandwidth con connection. It is not compute intensive, et cetera. Um, but it's good to know that what it does, it calls APIs that then call out to other things to move it, and it does need an outbound connection. So if you find yourself on a compute node and you can't get anywhere with it, well, that's why. Okay. When you start to touch the Globus platform, which is what the Globus CLI is doing, you're going to see a lot, a lot of UUIDs. So I'm going to show you a couple of steps here that where we start to see these UUIDs in practice. These are primary keys, effectively, in various tables and databases. So Globus endpoint search. We have this um, mix of noun and verb-based interactions. Actually, I apologize. Let me, if you get lost, Globus help, Globus dash dash help, and you see the initial level of commands. If I go to endpoint, I can do Globus endpoint dash dash help, and then I see the commands associated with that. For those of you familiar with Click, which is a Python-based package for building command line interfaces, that's what this is. I have here search, and I'm going to type in Globus Tutorial Endpoint. So the Globus Tutorial Endpoint, Endpoint, sorry, there's two of them, allow people to create um, their own shared endpoints. So we end up with a few of them. This UUID is the UUID for Globus Tutorial Endpoint 1, and this is the one for the other. So if I take this and I look at Globus Help, there's an ls command. And the basic pattern of using the ls command is Globus ls options endpoint path. There's a colon separating them. So if I do Globus, um, this should ls my home directory, because that's my default directory on the endpoint. And you see that I've got a bunch of stuff in there. One of the other things you can do um, when doing the ls, or sorry, not the ls, is the identities. And this is very relevant when we consider systems like Petrol or the upcoming community file system where you people will be have the ability to assign permissions to directories for access control through Globus that you're going to want to know the UUID associated with it. So if I do Globus get identities, brick at globus.org, there is a UUID. And so if you were wanted to set a permission um, granting me read access to a directory, you would do it through that. So summary for that is use Globus help and expect to see a UUID to refer to just about everything. <clears throat> so transfers are done from source to destination and they can be done with any number of files. And I'm gonna walk you through a readme or a document that uh, we've set up. So if you have a large number of files that you want to move, you can create a list of files from one and then use it to batch files from another. Let's walk through an example of this, which might fit 
a, a lot of your use cases. So in this use case, this is a recipe, it was an example of some work I was doing with someone else and I thought it'd be good to write up, is I needed to move data from theta to petrol. So it's very relevant to a lot of our cases. So I searched for theta and what I found was the UUID for the ALCF DTN theta. I also looked at the petrol endpoint that we use for the E3SM project. On the command line, to make my life easier, I created two uh, temporary environment variables to store the UUIDs. There were two directories on theta, run one and run two, that I needed to create filters for or create lists of files for as my source files. And then as my destination, I had one place that I wanted to send the data to. As you may recall, you have to have an endpoint activated. So the tokens in the Globus CLI allow you to talk to a Globus endpoint, or sorry, the Globus transfer service. But for your accounting Globus to talk to the endpoint, the endpoint must be activated. So I went to the web app and I activated Theta, whereas the Petrol endpoint, since it's a shared endpoint or guest collection, it'll be auto activated. So I verified is activated. So Globus endpoint is activated. I generated a list of files using the ls command with the filter option the filter option allows you to do basically like different type of wild carding or other searches on the two paths that I was interested in. I generated a list of files from run one and a list of files from run two. The syntax for the batch transfer, which uh, is important to know, is you can have a list of files to transfer that you have to specify the source and destination. In this case, I wanted them all to go to the same place, so I just named them the exact same thing with relative paths. So this is something you can learn as you go through the docs. So I just went through and generated a list of files for each of them. When you are doing a regular transfer, you say Globus transfer source, endpoint UUID, and path, and destination. This is very useful when you're doing a single file or a recursive directory transfer. So if you're familiar with SCP, please consider using this for a lot of your stuff because if you do a big SCP, it, it, you, you've got to keep whatever you're running that on going and the data is flowing through that SCP wherever you're running it. So if you're running on a login node and you're moving a lot of data, it's gonna take a while. Instead, a single command like this, if you become familiar with it, it will submit the transfer to Globus. The login node can go down, your laptop can go down, et cetera. Even one of the endpoints can go down and the transfer will pick up and recover. So Globus transfer, source destination, you can put a recursive option in there, stuff like that. In our case, all we have to do is instead use the batch command and down here at the end, we're just gonna inject the name of the files that we wanna transfer between the two endpoints. The tasks are submitted and we watch them and they run. And then when we're done, I went through and did a comparison to verify the, the totals. So this is a straightforward way to transfer large number of files and if you want to because you specify the source and destination names you can rename or move or reorganize files just by changing the names as they're being transferred so you might have them in one directory on your source and send them to 10 directories on your destination or change their names just line by line you can do that that may be relevant for some of your workflows
there are safe resubmits. So you can, if you are, if you want to ensure that you don't resubmit something, like if suppose I called my transfer command twice, like I fumbled on the command line or the system that I'm running this on is flaky. It's somebody else's system and it's a little node or something under a desktop, but I, I'm running a cron job on it and I worry that it gets, um, you know, shut down sometimes. You can pre-generate the task ID for a submission and then specify that. And that way you can actually monitor or ensure that if that command gets called twice with the same UUID, it won't re-trigger the same submission. So you, that way you can't fumble it on the command line if the machine was in the middle of something and comes back up. Um, <clears throat> you know, random things like the clock gets reset and the cron job gets run twice. I'm not saying I've seen it happen, but I'm not saying I haven't seen it happen. Another very useful command is task wait, which means that you can block on a transfer task and wait for it to complete or sometimes fail, but hopefully complete. For example, uh, we recently developed a short script for E3SM where they stage a lot of data in an archive at NERSC. And we only want to transfer portions of the files and they've got a uh, database table that we track the locations of several files in the archive. And so to transfer a subset, we have to introspect the database, build a list of files, stage them to disk, and submit the transfer. Um, we could just get the data staged and written to disk and then submit the transfer and forget about it. But a lot of times people want to watch that and make sure it completes, in particular, to clean up the files afterwards. So we have an option. You can either just run it and let it do its job and get the transfer submitted, or it will block, and when the transfer successfully completes, it then cleans up the stage data. So sometimes, as much as I love the asynchronous nature of the transfer, you may want to block on the task. If you are incorporating the Globus output into different formats or into different tools, like a script that I'll show you shortly, um, you'll see that you might want JSON or you might want to use the James path. This one I find particularly convenient is if you send it out as James path, it will look at the JSON format. Um, for those of you not familiar with JSON, it's a text format. looks a lot like a Python dictionary when you look at it in the interpreter. And it allows you to pluck out elements. So if you're getting a very, very verbose output, you can scope it down. So let me show you what that looks like. There's um, Globus endpoint search. So there's the search. So this is looking across all of my endpoints. And at this point, I only have one and it's a endpoint on a demo Jupyter Hub server that I've been running. So that is, like I said, a very convenient way to filter down and limit what you see. Turn off notifications if you want to, and permission management. <clears throat> so I mentioned that you want to we, we have the ability, so if you call from learning about Petrol, Petrol it has shared endpoints that we can then set permissions granted to users or groups on a folder level within the endpoint. So there is a, again, you can do anything that you can do through the browser. You should be able to do through Globus or the SDK. The permission create, this is an example here where we're giving read access to an identity, greg at globus.org, for a particular share. This one is probably the best one to start with. 
let's look at the permission list. And so first I'm going to do Globus endpoint search E3SM. This should find the petrol E3SM endpoint. Oh, and the Acme one. I'm going to take this UUID, Globus endpoint permission list, and I use my UUID. And by the way, I have the ability to view these because um, I'm an administrator on this. <clears throat> you can see why we might want to use something like James Path. So here uh, is several directories. We are using this endpoint within E3SM to distribute public data sets. And like we want to be able to share uh, certain things completely publicly and also we're using them for distributing some of our containers for analysis. So here under publications, like, let me just wrap that. Publications, you'll see we have both anonymous, which I know this is a little lengthy, and uh, all authenticated users. Anonymous means truly anonymous, and that is actually relevant when you have HTTPS capabilities on an endpoint. And because you can then say, if somebody is accessing that data through a web browser or through HTTPS, they do not have to have any authentication. They do not have, an, have to have an identity. It's literally just a public URL. So the users within E3SM can put data in that directory and then link to it from publications or reference it in other collections, and any researcher can then access it. The all authenticated users is one step up from that where it's anyone with a Globus login can access it, and that's really so that they can then transfer the data. So if you're distributing URLs, you know, there's practical limitations to what you can do with HTTPS. Um, in terms of wget and stuff, you can provide scripts to download lots of files, but Realistically, you're going to want at some point to be able to transfer it. Um, you could host reference data sets as TomoBank does, and then people could transfer them onto systems and distribute them for staging. Um, if you're in a large project, one of the things you could do with this is have a group permission on a single shared directory like Petrol, and then routinely and nightly replicate your reference data sets to different systems using your portal or just a cron job with the CLI. That is another very valid use case where you have reference or test data sets and you want to make sure they're routinely updated. So store them on a system like Petrol and submit a cron job to synchronize them routinely. And in fact, let's show you what that looks like. So automation with the CLI. Again, we're doing this as a user, so you need to have access to various things. All right, so, so I showed you the batch walkthrough and README that you could use to transfer large groups of files whenever you needed to um, between systems, and it gets you more familiar with the CLI. Here is your cheat sheet script for doing everything within the, uh, for replicating stuff. This uses the Globus CLI and you specify an import a starting directory and end directory that you could run this on any system that you can log into and submit a cron job. And then you just have to deal with endpoint activation to ensure that it runs. <clears throat> so the example I just said of, let's suppose you have petrol and you've got some reference data sets, and you want to ensure that they're re replicated every week, every night, whatever, to other systems, so they're fresh, uh, or what have you, you could use this script. If you are generating output from a simulation, 
and you want to ensure that you routinely copy that to the next system for processing <clears throat> so you can keep up with it, again, you can use the script. These UUIDs are the tutorial endpoints, tutorial endpoint one and tutorial endpoint two. And we're taking some sample data from that. It could have been that water table directory from Theta if I wanted it to be. And it is sending data to a demo. This is gonna be a recursive transfer. So at the baseline, it will just copy everything below this to below here. You could modify this and make it a batch transfer where you select certain files and rename them, et cetera. If you're familiar with rsync, you know that there's different sync types. Basically, move it if it's new, move it if it's got a different checksum, which is what we're using, if it's been modified, things like that. So this sync will look for, will copy all the files that don't exist on the destination or anything where the checksum is changed. So it's gonna walk through all of them. This also helps to ensure like if you have a trusted source where you know the data is valid, but on the other source, it suffered data corruption in the past. The checksum, of course, um, works around that. This is some boilerplate stuff to deal with um, how to handle errors or stepping out. First thing script does, this is just a sanity check to make sure that if it is running in a cron job, it doesn't resubmit. Um, the script does not generate a submission ID. Instead, what it does is it stores its previous submission and checks and says, I'm only gonna keep going if the last transfer completed successfully or if it failed. And this is because if it failed, we probably wanna resubmit and have it keep going. The only other option possible between succeeded and failed is still transferring. And we don't wanna resubmit if our transfer is still going. Here's another example of the format. First thing we're gonna do is get a list we're gonna to check to make sure that the source is a directory. And then if it is, this is the command that drives it all. We transfer it, we make it a recursive transfer from source to destination, and then we submit it and it runs and we give somebody a link to view the status. And if not, it fails. So this script, you can basically use to drive a lot of basic automation by routinely copying data from different locations. You could also modify it to call it when you needed to. Again, you have to be logged in to the Globus CLI to do that. Uh, portals can do this as well, uh, basically doing all that through the SDK. There's the sample scripts. Okay, so in the last few minutes, I wanna show you another resource you have for testing. This is our Globus uh, demo JupyterHub environment. So if you wanna get go deeper into the Globus CLI or the Globus uh, platform, in here we store our demonstration notebooks. And so everything that we were doing under the hood is available. And you can see how the code that's actually getting called. And so in this case, we have tokens in the notebook. And if you recall, we uh, actually did a Globus LS to find endpoints. And so we have the UUID here for tutorial one. And this is the command in the Globus SDK to go and look up details about one of the tutorial endpoints. So this notebook, if you want to try it out and go really deep into the SDK and learn about all the stuff that we did, but doing it all programmatically rather than through the CLI, Everything is in here, all the task management, um, all of the endpoint management, being able to bookmark stuff, things like that. So the other reason 
we have this is inside of Jupiter, if you're familiar with it or not, you can have a terminal and in this terminal we have installed the Globus CLI. The one note of caution I'll give you is you can't turn off refresh tokens in the Globus CLI. If you do log in using this for testing, I recommend you do a logout. We try to maintain this server, uh, this environment as best we can, but that's just a, a caution. Um, so you can, if you just want to get familiar with it and do some basic testing without installing it on your laptop, this is available to anybody with a Jupyter Hub, or sorry, a Globus login. Um, and with that, I appreciate everyone being patient. Yeah, I also want to point out that we will be distributing the slides after the uh, this webinar, um, so you will have access to the slides as well, and the recording will be available later on our website. I would like to thank Rick again, and also um, you guys for being here today. If you have any suggestions or questions, please don't hesitate to let us know. And uh, we'll see you for the next month. Thank you so much.